you've done that. We are going to have an introduction into the book of Revelation. This will be a short series on the basics of Revelation. Um, I have to confess, Revelation is not my strong point. But um, I realized as Sally was asking about the rapture that I never really have done a lot of lessons on the book of Revelation. And so I'm trying to, uh, to grow in my knowledge of the book of Revelation. And so by introduction, Revelation is a very fascinating and yet oftentimes confusing book because of the language that is used. Before we get into the language, we'll get into that in a lesson in a few weeks, but um, before we get into the language on that, it's important for us, I think, to approach the book of Revelation as we would approach any other New Testament book. We don't make a big deal about studying uh, the book to the Corinthians, first or second Corinthians. We don't we don't question that. And and so when we study these books, for example, uh, maybe maybe Galatians is a good is a better example. The book of Revelation was written to seven churches in the first century, probably about 90 to 96 AD. And and so John is the last living apostle, and we'll introduce John, we'll introduce those seven churches. But, so when the apostle Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, we read the letter to the Galatian Christians. We look at it, and we, we say, well, here's what Paul says. And we make application to our everyday lives based on what Paul says in the letter to the Galatians. And there were multiple churches involved. And so why should Revelation be any different? It's written to seven specific churches. There is a specific reason, just as Paul had a specific reason for writing to the Galatian Christians. And yet we make application to our lives today based on things that were relevant to the Galatians in the first century. The things written, I think you'll see, the things written in the book of Revelation are relative to the first century. They're relative to the time in which John was writing this. The language is what we call apocalyptic, and the apocalyptic language is not widely used in the Bible, but Daniel uses apocalyptic language. And as we start looking at some of the figurative language, Apocalyptic means figurative. As we start looking at the figurative language in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, because in Daniel, the, uh, the figurative language is explained in the book of Daniel. Daniel gives explanations about the dreams. Now, a lot of that mirrors Revelation in that the interpretations are similar. If you read the book of Daniel, all of the prophecies in the book of Daniel are fulfilled. Now, it is my belief that most, not all, most of the prophecies in the book of Revelation are fulfilled. However, there are still massive amounts of application, application that are applicable for today particularly the time in which we live in the book of Revelation. We'll get into that. But as, as I do with every book that I study, I ask myself four questions. Who? What? Or who, when, why, and what? Who was the book written to? We're told that in the introduction here. <clears throat> Some books, we don't, we're not really told who they were written to. So this is easy. Who was it written to? Who was it written by? When was it written? Now, this has been a, this has been a source of contention. Early Bible scholars uh, in, in the church particularly, uh, there are some commentaries written by Sam Brother, 
that gave the book of Revelation at a, before AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. And that is an incorrect dating method that was used for that. We'll get into that, but it was written about AD 90 or 96. And that is relevant to our interpretation of the book of Revelation and what John wanted Christians to see. When we date something, we need to put ourselves back into the position in which the Christians were when this was written. And we'll do that, Lord willing, next week. Why? Why was the book written? Why did the Holy Spirit reveal to John the things that are contained in this book? And so we'll get into that, possibly touch on that next week as well. And then final thing, and this may take multiple lessons, is what is in the book for us today? So with those four questions in our minds, we are going to begin by asking ourselves the who. And I hope you find this as fascinating as I did. It's, it's very important to look at the Bible, who was the author. Well, you will find in Revelation chapter 1, if you've got your Bibles, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. John identifies himself in verse 4 as the author. He also identifies himself in verse 9. Now, this is interesting because it is not typical of John to identify himself. John wrote the Gospel of John, yet does not identify himself as the author. John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, three letters, and yet does not identify himself as the author. But we know that that was John through artifacts, history, etc. But John identifies himself up front. I believe John identifies himself to put emphasis on this. Mind you, John is a very old man. He is way up in years. I, we don't know exactly how old, but he is probably in his 80s or 90s, somewhere in that period. He's very old when he's writing this. He is the last living apostle. And so in order for his letter to have the impact with the churches, he needs to identify himself that he has the authority to write this letter. In order for it to be received as a, an inspired letter from an apostle. Uh, secondly, who was the book written to? Seven churches. We see those listed to those in a moment. But I want to look a little bit closer at John the Apostle. Who is John? And I think that by understanding who John is, will give us a fuller picture of why he writes. Out of all New Testament writers, John has a unique writing style. John's tradition is to be the last person to write something. In his authorship of the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John was written many years after all of the other three Gospels. And therefore, John wrote things that were left out. He wrote details that other Gospel writers failed to record. And so the Gospel of John is filled with those details. I love the Gospel of John because John has an overlying message in that Gospel that other Gospel writers fail to capture. I'm not saying the other Gospels are not important, but John wrote things left out. As I mentioned, he's one of Jesus' 12 apostles. We can look that up. We won't for time's sake, but you can look that up in Mark chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. It lists the 12 apostles. Mark lists John as one of those apostles. In Matthew chapter 4, John is among some of the first apostles called to follow Christ. And not only is, is that the case, but he is also the son of Zebedee, the fisherman. So John was a fisherman by trade, following in his father's footsteps. When Jesus called him to be an apostle, he was actually mending a fishing net. His mother's name was Salome, 
Mary's sister. This makes John a first cousin to Jesus Christ by his mother. We find that in a couple of passages, Matthew chapter 27, verse 56, and in Mark 15, verse 40. Those passages indicate that to us as well. Younger brother of James. You will remember James was the first apostle to be killed by Herod in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. We know that he's his younger brother because of Mark chapter 10, verse 35. He was called the disciple whom Jesus loves in John by him, by his own pen in his own gospel, John chapter 21, 20 through 23. And throughout that, uh, John is known as the beloved disciple. He seems to have had some spatial relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ above and beyond what the other apostles had, not downplaying the other apostles in any way, shape, or form. He and his brother were called by Jesus the sons of thunder. I love that term. Uh, because of their request that they call down from heaven thunder and lightning to consume the unbelievers. Where he rejected the message of the Messiah. And Jesus reprimanded them for that. And, and yet I, I think... I think when John writes his gospel, you see a change in John. He writes more about love than hellfire and damnation. But yet as a young man, he was filled with hellfire and damnation. So I think, I think it's interesting we see, if, you, if we would do a case study on John, we would see a progression from a hellfire and brimstone follower of Christ into an older man who is more mature and realizes the love of Christ is greater than the judgment of Christ. He is the author of five New Testament books. We named those earlier. The Gospel According to John, written at about A.D. 80 to A.D. 98. There's a wide variation by Bible scholars on the dating of this book. But uh, I would say it leans a little bit more towards the earlier date than the later date. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Again, there's a, uh, uh, it's a narrower window of time. AD 90 to AD 95 seems to be the time period. Uh, it is assumed that John wrote these also from the Isle of Patmos, where he is in exile when he writes the book of Revelation. Um, but here again, we narrow these down. It's my, it's my belief the Gospel of John was written before 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, though there's no real proof for that. The, Re the book of Revelation, also known as John calls it the revelation of Jesus Christ, was written, uh, scholars believe, between A.D. 94 and A.D. 98. I believe AD 96 is, is probably the correct date for that, although there's speculation both directions. We really know that the window of time for this is very limited because as I mentioned, John is imprisoned by Domitian, emperor of Rome, on the Greek island of Patmos in the Agarian Sea. I'll have a map in just a moment. So why is John in prison? I think that's important for us to get out of the way. John is in prison because he defies the deity. The mission has set himself up as God. In fact, one of the cities we're going to look at had a, a temple to Apollo, a Greek god, and Domitian removed all the idols to Apollo and set up himself, images of himself as God, and was worshipped as God. And at the beginning of this, Christians and Jews were exempt from this, uh, this uh, worship of Domitian. But towards, in later years, Domitian decided he didn't want anybody who didn't worship him. 
And so he increased persecution on Christians. Now, secular history, I did not know this, and as, as I've said before, secular history is only as accurate as the person recording it. So, take this for what it is. Domitian, according to secular history, ordered John to be martyred, killed by boiling in oil. However, according to secular history, for what it's worth, the attempt to kill John by boiling him in oil failed, and he survived. The Roman government then decided that John was not killable, that, he, that, that for some reason God smiled down on him and he was not killable. The Apostle Paul had a similar fate. He was stoned but did not die. So they decided they couldn't kill him, the next best thing they could think of was to exile him on the island of Patmos. Patmos has an interesting history. I don't want to get too deep into it because we don't have time. But Patmos was at one time a Greek resort island. When Greece was conquered by Rome, this resort was dismantled, taken, destroyed, and it was used as an island of isolation for prisoners that the Roman government wanted to destroy. Food, shelter, all of those things were very scarce on Patmos. Now, again, I don't know how accurate history is. Historians believe, and again, I'm skeptical of this one, uh, but historians believe that they have found uh, a cave. For, they, they think they might have found the exact cave in which John lived in on Patmos. Again, it's a lot of time has lapsed. Whether the writings on the wall of the cave that indicate John was there, if this is where he saw the vision that became the book of Revelation, I don't know. But nevertheless, life on Patmos was hard. Again, secular history tells us he was released from Patmos in AD 98. So, at the end of this, he is released. Supposedly, he goes home to Ephesus, which is where he resided until his death. True or not, I don't know. What we do know about John, you can see on the screen, most of these things are verifiable by Scripture, which, of course, is our only source of, of concrete authority, is the Bible. <coughs> The seven churches. Who are they? What do we know about them? This is important to our study of the book of Revelation. Because in order to realize what John is talking about, we need to understand. Yes, it is preserved for us in the New Testament. So there must be something that applies to our lives. But specifically, it's written to seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis. Philadelphia, and Laodicea. This is the order in which they're listed in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 3. You'll see on the map, here is Patmos. Here's where John was in exile at. Now, in order to get a letter out of Patmos, this letter had to go by carrier, by ship, to Ephesus. And Ephesus is named first on the list of cities. And they're listed in order in which they would have been traveled to by carrier. I thought that was so interesting. John knew geographical locations. He knew exactly where this carrier would have to go. Again, remember, John is bringing a letter to Christians. Christianity is not legal under Domitian's rule. Christianity is under persecution, and so it's my belief that is the reason that John used what we call apocalyptic language, or having a hidden meaning. If the letter would have fallen into the wrong hands, it would never have gotten off of Patmos. 
If Roman soldiers looked at the letter and understood the underlying message of the book of Revelation, if I can sum it up in, in a very short message, Revelation 2 and, and verse 10 is the underlying message. When, when John is writing to the church at Smyrna, he says, I know your tribulation in verse 9, your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Notice verse 10. If you can sum the book of Revelation up in a very short one verse answer, here's the answer. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days. Tribulation will be short. The 10 days, again, is a metaphorical term depicting a short tribulation period for Christians living under Domitian's rule. He says that you may be tested for 10 days. You will have tribulation. Persecution is a sure thing. But here is the good news. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. If I can sum the book of Revelation up, I would sum the book of Revelation up in that verse. There's a lot more to the book of Revelation, and there's a lot more applicable to us today than just that. Lord willing, we'll get to that. But I do want us to see that it was important for Revelation, if you will, to be in code in order for them to escape. And even today, I'm not going to claim to have all the answers to the book of Revelation because it is in apocalyptic or in code language. As I said, the book of Daniel will come into play when we go understanding the meanings behind it. So these seven churches, what do we know? Some of them we know quite a bit about. Ephesus, for example, we know a lot about Ephesus. We know a lot about the Christians there uh, because uh, Ephesus was founded by the Apostle Paul in AD 52. We know that from the book of Acts chapter 18 ver and verse 19. This is on Paul, uh, Paul's uh, uh, second missionary journey. On his third missionary journey, Paul spent two to three years at Ephesus from A.D. 54 to A.D. 56. And so he spent a good amount of time in Ephesus. One of the biggest challenges that the that Christians in Ephesus faced, they were coming out of paganism. They were coming out of Judaism. Well, those coming out of paganism were worshipers of the goddess Diana. You will read about this in the book of Acts, chapter 19. There were so many people being converted to Christ that they were leaving Diana. Diana was a, a, a goddess of fertility. I, I really toyed with putting a picture up here, but uh, Kate was like, no. <laughs> she is not a pretty goddess and not necessarily modest, so it would not do, do well for us to do that. But what happened was so many people left idolatry of Diana to worship the living God that it put a it, it put an economic depression on silversmiths. Their trade was fueled by making silver statues that you could carry with you of the goddess Diana. You know, after all, everyone wants to have a pocket god. You know, and, and so it's not unlike some people today. We want to have charms or necklaces that depict something and they're spatial to us. Well, in Ephesus, the goddess Diana was something that people, they wanted their little statue for their home or they wanted their statue, like I said, a pocket god. And you can read about that, Acts chapter 19, 26 through 41. Paul made a final visit to Ephesus on his way to Jerusalem. Now, maybe he visited uh, sometime in between, but his final visit was in AD 57. 
In fact, in Acts chapter 20, Paul makes a statement to the elders at Ephesus that they would never see his face again. And they wept. They were very sorry that Paul was going to be, Paul knew that his life was coming to a close. He knew that his work as a missionary and a Christian, an apostle for Christ, was coming to an end. The Holy Spirit revealed that to him. And the Holy Spirit also revealed to him that he would never see the brethren at Ephesus again. So Paul wrote a letter from prison in AD 62. By AD 96, you know, and we've got that Ephesian letter by Paul, so we know a lot about what's going on. We know their weaknesses. We know their strengths. We know what Paul wanted them to do. And Paul is building them up in the faith in AD 62. But notice when, when we see what John writes to Ephesus here in, in Revelation, uh, and we'll get into that as, as probably, probably next week. Um, but as he writes, we realize Ephesus is not the church that Paul founded. A generation has passed and the church is, I say, wilting. They're fading. Uh, I, I do want to read a couple of things here that, that John does write to the Ephesian Christians. He says, in, in, uh, he says, I know your works, Revelation 2.2. 2. Your toil and your patient endurance. How you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So what it is, is they have they've become complacent. I call it the compliant Christians. Ones who are no longer on fire for Christ, but are just simply assembling, filling the pew, not really active. So we see this as a church, and, you know, John commends them for their patience. Christ, through John, commends them for their patience, their endurance. He says, I wish you would be active. You know, someone one time put it this way to me, and this is a pliable for us today. A church that is not growing is dying. A church is like a tree. Every year, a tree adds a new growth rate around the base. If that tree fails to add that growth ring, it's dead. A church is like that. There is no stagnant position. If there was, Ephesus would be there. But the truth is, there's no stagnant position. The church at Ephesus is dying. That brings us to the church of Samaria. What do we know? Honestly, we don't have a letter to Smyrna. We don't know a lot about it. Smyrna is a seaport, about 35 miles. If you remember the map, it's about 35 miles to the north of Ephesus. Today, the city is called Izmir, Turkey. The church here was possibly founded by Paul, although we do not know that for sure. Uh, history tells us it was founded around AD 52. Maybe it wasn't by Paul. Maybe it was by other Christians traveling in the area. Fact is, we don't know. But if it was founded by Paul, it would have been on his second missionary journey. And maybe it was some of Paul's traveling companions traveling in that area of Smyrna. But it seems likely that it was Paul and his companions that founded the church. One of the fun facts that I found about the name Smyrna, it is the, it is the Greek version of the Jewish word for myrrh. If you remember your Bible history, myrrh is a, myrrh is a perfume that was used uh, when Jesus was born. He was given gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Also, myrrh was used to anoint someone who was dead. It was called the perfume of the living, Matthew 2, 2 11, and the dead, John 19, 39. So it was an important part of, of Jews. 
But what I find interesting is about myrrh, myrrh only gives off its fragrance when it is crushed. I don't know if it's symbolic about the Smyrna church, but sometimes we have to face challenges before we rise to the occasion. And maybe that's the case here at Smyrna. You know, the basic, basic message to Smyrna is the overcoming that I read. They're going to be tested. They're going to be tried. And yet the message is, be faithful unto death, and you will receive a crown of life. Pergam. Pergam was said to be a beautiful city, located at the tributaries for the Canis River, a city of art, and consequently, idolatry. For some reason, idolatry and art go hand in hand. Artists feel the need to depict what they believe to be God. And Pergam is a great example of that. Uh, again, this congregation may have been founded by Paul on his second missionary journey, give or take, A.D. 52. I don't know. We're not told. But Pergam in Revelation chapter 2, one thing we learn about the church, and again, this is, this is uh, consequences of the idolatry that already exist in Pergam. In verse 13, John says, I know where you dwell. He says, I know where you as Christians are. He says, where Satan's throne is. No other city on John's list has such a dark side. To their geographical location that Christians are in. To be told that they are where Satan's throne is. He says, yet hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Anipus, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. We'll get into, we'll get into that message again a little bit more. But we know that Pergam was not a city where Christians were welcomed, or even welcomed. Bringing us to Thyatira. I want to try to get through this list today. I know we're running short on time, but Thyatira, known as Kenesar, Turkey today, it's a small city, the smallest of all seven, listed by John, 45 miles to the southeast of Pergam, on the river Lycius. Famous for its textiles, especially the production of the famous purple dye. This is the birthplace of Lydia, who was a, the first Christian at Philippi. Lydia had left Thyatira, a seller of purple. She traded in purple. This was her livelihood. She went to Philippi, where the Apostle Paul converted her as one of the first Christians of Philippi in Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Thyatira was the home of the sun god, Tyronius. Tyronius, Ty, 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 I guess. One of the challenges that Christians at Thyatira faced was there was a well-established trade guilds. We would call them unions today. They were called trade guilds at that time period. Now the problem, you might say, well, that's a great place to live. There's unions, they take up for you. You have, you have a, you belong to a trade guild. The problem was in Thyatira and throughout the Roman Empire, every trade guild had a god, an idol over top of their guild. Thyatira. The main trade guild was the purple industry. Lydia was part of the purple industry, and so she, she worshipped the god of the purple trade guild. Now, I don't know a lot. I don't have a lot of information in front of me on the, on the gods for the specific trade guilds, but I did find that Thyatira was filled with them. 
Tent makers had a trade guild. Wagon makers, wheelwrights had trade guilds. Uh, my brother-in-law's last name is Wagner. It comes from the wagon makers trade guild. Um, and so these trade guilds had lasting effects even down to the present day, not just in last names, but as the parenting of the modern day unions. But as I said, the challenge was for Christians, you could not be a Christian and worship an idol that belonged to a trade guild. If you didn't worship the idol that was the idol of the purple trade guild, you couldn't be part of that trade guild. And so you had no work. There was no work available to you as a Christian unless you renounced your Christian faith in AD 96. If you renounced your Christian faith and you worshiped the idol, you were welcomed back into that trade guild. On the other hand, if you refused, you could not be a part of the trade guild. Now, these trade guilds were allowed to operate under Domitian because they gave him the position as head god and yet retained their idolatry to the other gods. The church at Sardis. Sardis is the oldest city that I think we've listed here. Um, again, don't know lots about it, but it's located at the base of Mount uh, Tolmos near uh, the um, edge of the Pactolius River. Viewed as a nearly impregnable city at one time, however, it had earthquakes. In AD 17, Sardis was nearly destroyed by an earthquake that left the city in ruins and it never recovered. It had a reputation for being economically depressed, both financially and spiritually. Sardis was a depressed place. And so when John in Revelation chapter 3 writes to this church, remember, this city has been destroyed by an earthquake. John says, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive. Here they are. They're in a dead town. It's kind of like being from Elba. You know, there's just not much there. It's kind of scuzzy. Been destroyed by a flood a few times. Who wants to be from Elba? Sorry, I hope no one ever listens to this online from Elba. But, um, but nevertheless, he says, you have a reputation of being alive. He said, but you're pretty dead. You're pretty well doomed. He says, awake, wake up. Strengthen what remains. Friends, where there is life, there is hope. For congregations around the valley that are small in number, for congregations that feel like they're downtrodden, if your doors are still open, there's life. There is hope. Philadelphia. Philadelphia was destroyed by the same earthquake that destroyed Sardis in AD 17. It's small very small city in a small congregation of Christians in Philadelphia, if I understand from history correctly. And yet, this church, out of all the churches that John writes to, is referred to as the mighty church. It's a church that caught the attention of historians for purity, and faithfulness. In fact, John writes, when he's writing to this church, he says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, Revelation 3 and verse 8, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, 
but lie, behold, I will make them come bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. What a powerful statement to this congregation. There is more, but we might say that they are the mighty church. Seven, even though they're the smallest congregation. Laodicea. <laughs> Laodicea. Oh, it's a, it's a wealthy city. The richest of all. The temple of Apollo was here at Laodicea, as I said. Domitian took out the statues to Apollo, replaced them with his own statues. We don't know the founder of this congregation. Maybe Paul? I really rather doubt it. I imagine that because the Laodiceans were such a wealthy city, there were people traveling through. Christianity may have gotten here before. Uh, several scholars believe that it was um, Epaphras who founded this congregation because it is not very far from Colossae. And so Epaphras, we know from the scripture, worked heavily at Colossae. And Colossae seems to be the parent congregation of Laodicea. Several people traveled to Colossae from Laodicea and vice versa. And so a congregation seems to have been established at Laodicea as a result of that, according to history. Again, no Bible backing on this, but interesting to contemplate. The Laodicea's wealth came from their location on a major trade route. And again, once again, the Temple of Apollo was, and still stands today, in ruins, but the remnants are there for us to see today. Um, and it was, it was used as the worship place for what is known as the Roman imperial cult. Right around the time, maybe a little bit after, some scholars say during the time, but right around the time this book of Revelation is being written. This temple is used as the worship place for this area of the imperial cult. Now, I found that so fascinating because we'll get into this in later in the book of Revelation. When we're getting the message, it's important to remember the Roman imperial cult and the idol of worship. So in closing, we've used our time up this morning for our study. I hope it's been a good introduction into the who's, who is John, who are the churches. It's important for us to lay that foundation work so that we understand who's who in the book of Revelation. But what can we really take away from this? What is there? Well, as with any book in the New Testament, we need to take what we read and make application. I encourage you, go home this week, read the seven churches. Read the seven churches with an open and honest heart. Churches are made up of individuals. They're not just a group of people that have nothing in common. Churches are made up of individuals. And so when, when John writes, for example, to the church of the Laodiceans, his accusation is that you're lukewarm. You're not cold, you're not hot. You're somewhere in the middle. And it's distasteful to God. Okay, I'd use that as an illustration. When you read about these churches, ask yourself about your faith. For example, am I lukewarm? Am I cold? Am I hot? Am I a Perga? Am I a Sardis? Am I a Thyatira Christian? Where's my faith? Because this letter was written for you. It's been preserved for us. These seven churches no longer really exist. The letter does. And if we can see ourselves, James says that the word of God is like a mirror. We are to look at ourselves and see how we compare. So when you pick up the book of Revelation and read chapters 1, 2, and 3, what church are you? What kind of Christian are you?
and let's make application. If we see that we are, if we see that we are at a lay of a sin and we're lukewarm in our faith, let's make application to that. Let's turn the heat up or turn the cold down. I don't care. But let's 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 make sure, you know, the thing is, here's the thing. It's it's like coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, some of you are. You know, you have hot coffee and you want it hot, even though someone sued McDonald's for hot coffee. But you want that coffee as hot as you can possibly get it. Well, then they come out with iced coffee. Well, you don't want that at room temperature either. There's nothing worse than room temperature coffee. So make application. Maybe, maybe, maybe Laodicea has nothing to do with you. Maybe, maybe, and I hope the case is, maybe we're all Philadelphians. And we are the rock and steady. And if so, take a message from Philadelphia. There's a message for that church there. And there's a message for Christians that fall into that category. Each of those seven churches could be us. Where are we? And each of the reprimands could also be for us. Let's make some application. You can do that on your own. We'll come together next week. I want to delve a little bit more in. These are specific messages in Revelation chapter 1 through 3 for the seven churches. Then chapter 4 and beyond is a message for Christians everywhere. This is a common theme. John makes specific applications in 1 through 3. Chapter 4 on is a message for everybody. And I want to focus primarily in this study on the message for everyone. So, take your Bibles home, that message, and see where you are. If you find yourself being reprimanded by God through the mirror of his word, maybe we need to reevaluate. Hear the word of God. Make an application to that word of God. If you're a child of God, change your life. If you're not a child of God, you read that word, let it speak to your heart. Believe that it is true. Repent of the direction in which you're heading. Confess, for Jesus says by, by the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And then be buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. It's a very simple message, but it is a message that has application to everyone here. Whether you are a Philadelphian, or whether you're a Sardis, or a Laodicean Christian, or whether you're not a child of God, there's a message for you as well. But the overall theme is be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Won't you get your books out?